Good morning and welcome to the sixth meeting of the Social Security Committee in 2018. Um, can I welcome everyone to committee, especially both staff and members who have made a Herculean effort to be here this morning. It's much appreciated. And I remind everyone to turn their mobile phones or other devices to silent. And we have received apologies from Pauline McNeill and there will be no substitute for Pauline this morning. There's only one item on today's agenda, a continued consideration of Social Security Bill at Stage 2. The marshalled list and groupings covering all remaining amendments are with the committee and we will continue where we left off last week and um, a reminder that we have to finish at the very, very latest at 11.40 this morning. Can I welcome the Minister and we will welcome our officials when they arrive this morning um, to committee and um, before we start it's my understanding that the amendments in the name of Pauline McNeill are to be moved by Mark Griffin. Can you confirm that, Mark? Yeah, continue to yeah but I'm happy to move Pauline's amendments. Thank you very much. So we will now move to the first group, offences, and I call Amendment 94 in the name of Pauline McNeill, grouped with amendments as shown as the group in the groupings list, and I ask Mark Griffin to move Amendment 94 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. I move Amendment 94 in the name of Pauline McNeill. Um, amendment 94 along with the other amendments in this group um, and Paula McNeill's names are sponsored by and lodged on the advice of Justice Scotland and respond to concerns raised about proposed offences in the bill. As we discussed at stage one, the offences as drafted are overbroad and imprecise and criminalise conduct which is careless or negligent rather than um, dishonest. At stage one, we heard that while the policy memorandum makes clear then, that the policy intention is not to criminalise genuine errors, but the bill makes it an offence um, to fail to report changes um, when um, a person knows it might affect entitlement and also when they ought to have known. And we feel that ultimately the bill sets a test which is too low it's not that they intended to commit an offence, rather they can make an offence without knowingly have done so. The recommendation that this committee made was that the, the bill was to be clarified to ensure that genuine errors or misunderstandings will not result in someone being criminalised. And having considered the amendments the Scottish Government proposed, um, we're not fully content that that bar has been adequately uh, raised. I think we should remind ourselves that this section um, as presently drafted would allow the conviction of an honest claimant who it was deemed should have known that change would have resulted um, in a change to the entitlement. It criminalises behaviour or conduct which is careless or negligent rather than intentionally dishonest. Um, additionally, the safeguard of a requirement for proof that benefits would have been affected uh, is absent. We do also have um, concerns about the use of a uh, language that the government proposed. Um, a quote that the person does not have a reasonable excuse for failing to do so. Um, and I would ask perhaps if the minister was able to elaborate um, on that particular line, perhaps the detail and its existing use in Scots law and also what a reasonable excuse has been interpreted as. Um, I think any support that um, we would offer um, for that amendment, I think, is done so reluctantly and only because it, it improves the situation, but not as much um, as we would like it to be improved. Um, the focus of Justice Scotland's advice has been in comparison to the UK offences um, framework and well, we would and should not be looking to replicate the UK system. Um, we do feel that the, the tests in the bill are out of step um, and are, are more severe than those in use in the UK system. Um, I'm happy to, to move these amendments in this group and have the, um, the, the debate today um, to see if we can come to a, a common conclusion, perhaps not at this stage, but um, perhaps in advance of stage three as to um, any room for further further improvement. Thank you, Kimura. 
Thank you. I um, can invite the Minister to speak to Amendment 46 and the other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. And before I do, can I also express my thanks to you, Convener, and members and to staff for uh, being here this morning and uh, allowing this session to go ahead. Uh, on this particular section, our policy position is clear that we will treat people fairly with dignity and respect and pay the assistance they are entitled to receive. But we have to strike the right balance and we have a duty to ensure public funds are protected with consequences for those who choose to intentionally defraud the system. My amendment in this group seeks to do that by introducing into section 40 the ability of a person to defend themselves from prosecution if they have a reasonable excuse for failing to notify a change of circumstances. I have listened to stakeholder concerns about this section and to the views of the committee and have brought forward amendment 46 to address them. Section 40 in the bill says that an offence is committed if someone fails to notify a change of circumstances which under section 31 they have a duty to notify and the person knows or ought to know that the change in circumstances might reduce or stop someone's entitlement to assistance. The concern is that a person might have a good excuse for not notifying a change in circumstances and should not be criminalised for an honest mistake, a concern that I share and understand. That is why my amendment addresses the point it is all that is needed to address stakeholders' concerns. The amendments proposed by Ms McNeill to Section 40 take a different approach, but tip the scales so far in the other direction that they would render the section ineffectual. Her amendments risk making offences so difficult to prosecute that nobody will take the risk of prosecution seriously. The Scottish Agency will be clear with people up front about the reasons why they have been awarded assistance, what types of information and changes of circumstances they should report, and how they should report them. This differs from the approach currently taken under existing UK legislation, where the DWP is under no obligation to provide this level of detail. I do understand that in certain circumstances, DWP in practice does provide detail, but the key part here is that under UK legislation, they are under no obligation to provide that. The use of knowingly in DWP legislation rightly sets a high legal burden on prosecutors to prove a person's subjective knowledge in not notifying a change of circumstances because people are not required to be told precisely what they have to notify. That makes it easy for a person to make a mistake. The Scottish system will be fundamentally different. People will be clear about what changes must be notified so that all is required to ensure that persons who have a reasonable excuse can give their explanation. If a person has a reasonable excuse, they would have an opportunity during uh, an investigation by the agency to explain the mitigating circumstances. These factors are then taken into account before officials of the agency concluded uh, their investigation and where a genuine error had happened, prosecution would not take place. But if prosecution were to take place, the excuse is the defence in terms of uh, against conviction. Ms McNeill's Amendment 94 about what a person knew when providing false information is unnecessary. Section 39 refers to an intention to cause assistance to be given incorrectly. To intend something, a person must know that what they do will cause it to happen. Section 41 has no need of the additional words of her amendment, which would confuse references to what a person knew or ought to have known. As I've said, we'll tell people the changes in circumstance they need to notify, and it will be clear what they ought to have known. Finally, we come to section 42. This section allows senior figures in an organisation, such as a company or partnership, to be convicted of an offence if the organisation commits offence because of the connivance, consent or neglect of the senior official. Amendment 101 would remove the neglect element of that. Section 42 is worded in the usual way for a section of its kind, the same wording can be found in, for example, the Air Weapon Offences, uh, Air Weapon and Licensing Act 2015, 
in terms of environmental harm, uh, in terms of the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act of 2006, and again, as a further example, the Criminal Justice and Licensing Scotland Act of 2010. There are other examples, but the question I have to ask is why senior officials of an organisation should not be held personally responsible if they neglect their duties, allowing their organisation to commit social security fraud. A company director who has been turning a blind eye to an organisation's involvement in fraud should have a case to answer. And I cannot therefore support Amendment 101, nor for the reasons I have given do I support the other amendments from Ms McNeill in this group, and I would urge uh, the committee to reject them. I move my amendment. Thank you, Minister. Um, does anyone else wish to come in on this issue? Mr McPherson? Uh, yeah. Briefly, Convener, thank you. I just, uh, in, in uh, similar terms to the Minister, have concerns about these amendments with regard to the burden of proof and also what uh, prosecutors would be expected to, to prove and, and uh, how that would be undertaken if uh, knowingly was the, the, uh, the position that they had to, to evidence. I think the Minister's amendment uh, is sufficient in terms of making sure that there is protection for those who, who are claiming and that they are not uh, prosecuted unduly or unnecessarily. And uh, I would urge Mark Griffin uh, not to press these amendments. Thank you. Uh, Ms Johnson? I'd like to, to hear further from the Minister. Um, certainly organisations who have contacted me have, have pointed out that under the current UK system it's not an offence if a person doesn't actually know that a change in circumstances might affect their benefit or that information they've provided is wrong. But as it stands, it means that the bill means that a, it, an individual in Scotland will, even with um, the Government Amendment 46, be at risk of prosecution. Um, and I, I've been given a, a, a couple of scenarios that, that illustrate this point. For example, if I, if I may, Convener, um, here's an example. Ian lives in England, his sister Mary lives in Scotland, and they go to visit their, their mum overseas. They've both got caring responsibilities and they get carer's allowance. Um, neither of them tells the respective carer's allowance authorities that they're going abroad. But when they come back, they are both told that they've been overpaid carer's allowance. Um, and the decision makers in each case take the view that they should have asked whether the absence abroad would affect their entitlement. Now, Ian lives in England. He has a, a £50 penalty imposed and has to repay the overpaid allowance, but he can't be prosecuted because he didn't actually know that going abroad would affect his benefit, even though he could have found out if he tried. But Mary also has to repay her cares allowance. On top of that, her case is passed to the Procurator Fiscal's office um, for consideration, and she can be prosecuted for fraud, even though she's only made a mistake and hasn't acted dishonestly. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it is my view that, that Pauline McNeill has tabled these amendments to ensure that there are the same safeguards in Scotland um, as there are in UK law and that the person would actually have to know that a change could affect their benefit, um, that they'd have to know the information they've given is false. Um, certainly. I mean, obviously... If the, if the offence is that the individual cannot be prosecuted unless the prosecution can prove that he or she knowingly acted in the way that you've described... Isn't it the case that such offences would, in practice, never be prosecuted because the prosecution would never be able to prove that? Well, I think it's clear that there are, <laughs> there are, there are areas of concern that are being raised um, by, by organisations with us, and that's why I'm asking the, the Minister for clarity. Um, and it's clearly the case that we seem to be looking at two... Obviously, we have different systems in Scotland, uh, as we do down south, on a range of issues, but I'm just interested as to why that should be the case in this particular instance. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to comment? No, Minister, would you like to respond? To yes, happily so. Thank you, Convener. Um, um, before I answer the specific question um, that Ms Johnson's read, can I say that Mr Tompkins helpfully got to the heart of the matter in terms of what is required by the word knowingly, uh, in terms of the burden of proof on the prosecution, which, as I said in my statement, makes it uh, virtually impossible to prosecute uh, which takes me back to my point about the need to strike the balance between ensuring we have a fair and reasonable system where people receive what they're entitled to, but also being mindful 
of the need, the duty, in fact, to protect the public purse from fraudulent behaviour. And we should be clear and sensible and expect that in a new system, as well as in any other public service system, uh, there will be individuals who will seek, in a concerted manner perhaps, to try to test that system in terms of its capacity to identify and prosecute fraudulent behaviour. With respect to the specific question that Ms Johnson asked me, um, without the benefit of uh, having anything more than just hearing uh, these uh, two scenarios, can I say, first of all, that I disagree with the interpretation of the case with respect to England. I think, as I made clear, that the individual could be prosecuted because in terms of the UK legislation, there is no requirement on the DWP to identify in detail what an individual should uh, uh, report as changes in circumstance. So I disagree that uh, Ian, in this instance, uh, would be beyond prosecution. With respect to uh, his sister, Mary, uh, my amendment precisely prevents Mary being prosecuted if she can provide a reasonable excuse. Mr Griffin asked me, so I shall take this opportunity to respond. As I understand it, I'm sure Mr Tompkins will correct me, he understands these things better than I do, uh, but as I understand it, there is a fairly standard test in our Scottish courts about a reasonable person. Uh, and what would be considered a reasonable excuse. And of course, that would be the test that would be applied, the standard test in Scottish courts about what is reasonable and reasonableness. If the agency considered an excuse was not reasonable and wished to then pass the matter on to the criminal justice service, which is what it would do, it would no longer be the agency's role, then, of course, our Procurator Fiscal Service would exercise their good, sound judgment in determining whether a case was viable for prosecution and likely to be prosecuted. And I would imagine, in the vast majority of cases, our Prosecution Service set a high standard in terms of what they believe should be prosecuted and would not proceed. So I think Ian, in this instance, would not be uh, in the fortunate position he is in the scenario, but Mary most certainly would be. Thank you, Minister. Can I invite Mr Griffin to wind up and to press or withdraw his amendment? Thank you, Kimira. I fully support the Minister's aim in protecting the public purse uh, where someone is intentionally defrauding the system. Um, but I still have a, a concern um, that where this happens unintentionally someone is still at, at risk of prosecution. I take on board what Minister and other members have said about the, the balance that needs to be struck and that if the, the balance um, in Ms McNeill's amendments would leave um, the, the situation that Minister outlines as being Im impossible to, to prosecute and to protect um, those public funds from intentionally um, defrauding and I would seek to withdraw Amendment 94, um, but look for the government to continue discussions with Pauline McNeill and other organisations who have concerns about how the balance would still remain with this amendment um, ahead of Stage 3. Thank you, uh, Mr Griffin. So um, the question is that the committee agree that 94 be withdrawn. I'm not sure we should. I, mean, I wonder if um, I don't think I don't see there is any need for this issue to be revisited at, at stage three. I think we should um, take a view on it now at stage two. Well, the process by which that would happen would be for you to move the amendment, Mr. Tompkins. So you... um, am I allowed to move an amendment and the vote against it? Yes. Yes. I move the amendment. So the question is that Amendment 94 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. Oh. Um, so move to <coughs> division. Um, and uh, so the question is that 94 be agreed. Can those in favour please raise their hands? Those against? And any abstentions? Thank you. Um, the result of the division is two votes for, six votes against, then, therefore the amendment is not agreed. The next question is that section 39 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you.
call Amendment 95 in the name of Polly McNeill, already debated with Amendment 94, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Not move. The question is, oh sorry, um, I call Amendment 46 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 94, and ask the Minister to formally move. Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 46 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Call Amendment 96 in the name of Paul McNeill, already debated with Amendment 94, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. Call Amendment 97 in the name of Paul McNeill, already debated with Amendment 94, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Not move. Question is, oh sorry, the question is that Section 40 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? So I call Amendment 98 in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with Amendment 94, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Not move. I call Amendment 99 in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with Amendment 94, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Not move. I call Amendment 100 in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with Amendment 94, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Not move. Uh, the question is that Section 41 be agreed. Are we all agreed? I call it Amendment 101 in the name of Polly McNeill, already debated with Amendment 94, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. The question is that Section 42 be agreed. Are we all agreed? The question is that Section 43 and 44 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. We now move to the next grouping, which is uprating. I call Amendment 47 in the name of the Minister, grouped with the amendments shown in the groupings list, and invite the Minister to move Amendment 47 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Uh, I have always been clear that we will maintain spending on disability and employment injury assistance through annual operating, so that what people receive is not eroded by inflation. That is important to the people who rely on these benefits. I am pleased to support an extension of that commitment through Mr Griffin's amendments to my Amendment 48, so that the duty will also apply to carers' assistance. The Bill allows implementation of this policy through the rate-setting powers within the regulations for the individual types of assistance. I do not support Mr Griffin's other amendments, which, which would introduce unnecessary procedures, result in complexity and slow matters down. I welcome the committee's recommendation in Stage 1 report, which suggests a pragmatic approach in terms of annually reviewing the rates of assistance having regard to inflation. Therefore, my amendments puts, put the government's policy commitment and the committee's recommendation onto a statutory footing. These would commit ministers to annually review the rates of devolved social security assistance having regard to the impact of inflation and explain our decisions in a report to Parliament. And they also place a duty on ministers to bring forward legislation to annually uprate the value of disability and employment injury assistance by inflation, with amendments 48A, B and C would now include carers' assistance to that group. This is in addition to the 13% increase, which we will deliver as our first benefit uh, following passage of this bill, bringing carers' allowance in line with job seekers' allowance. My amendment set out very clearly that ministers are going to do what ministers are going to do on annual uprating, but I have concerns about the other amendments proposed. They do not fully commit members to uprate. They just require ministers to explain which assistance types will be uprated and to provide reasons for those they have decided not to uprate. That said, there are many similarities between my amendments and those uh, numbers two and three from Ms Johnson. In a broad sense, they look to do very similar things. But my amendments do not require a bespoke power to implement uprating decisions, which simplifies the process, and they also commit, clearly commit ministers to uprate disability and employment injury assistance, and with Mr Griffin's amendments, also carers' assistance. Amendment 2 would not require ministers to do this. I'm also unconvinced at uprating any top-up benefits that may be provided through regulations under Part 3 would be a good idea. The top-up amounts are likely to be relatively small in comparison to the underlying benefit and would result in extremely modest increases. I would therefore invite Ms Johnson not to press her amendments 2 and 3 and to support my amendments instead. I would urge the committee to reject amendments 133, 134, 135, 136 and 137. 
These would result in an overly bureaucratic and process-heavy system for annual uprating. My amendments are clear on what ministers have to do with regards to uprating, whereas these amendments say more about how uprating should be done through powers to make regulations about other regulations. It is difficult to see any advantage in this approach. I believe the process of annual uprating should be a simple operation and must be responsive to ensure that individuals receive any increase in assistance as quickly as possible. It is in no way certain that this could happen with the requirements placed by these amendments. Before uprating regulations to increase rates could be laid, the regulations setting up an uprating framework would have to be agreed with the Parliament. This would require at least 60 session days. But if Parliament said no to those regulations, a further lengthy process is needed. That seems highly unresponsive, and I would urge committee members to reject these amendments. I ask amendments to support the amendments in my name and move Amendment 47. Thank you, Minister. Can I invite Mr Griffin to speak to Amendment 48A and to the other amendments in the group? Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we welcome uh, the Government's substantial movement on um, this issue. While we appreciate that it's always been the Government's policy intention to provide uprating to disability assistance, I think it's been a fairly um, recent change um, that this should be included within this legislation and we absolutely uh, welcome that change and support it. Um, Amendment 40A to C in my name seek to modify the bill to ensure that carers' assistance is uprated and that guarantee is secured in the bill um, as a standard practice under the UK scheme for carers' allowance. Um, we th assume that the Scottish Government will soon take on the full delivery of carers' assistance at a combined higher rate, at which point it would exercise powers under sections 48 to repeal the temporary provision, and these amendments seek to ensure that um, a fully devolved carers' assistance then tracks inflation. And clearly, the, the flaw of the formula under section 47 forces the Scottish Government to pass on the UK government benefit freeze because of the link to um, GSA. Um, and we appreciate uh, the government's support for these particular amendments in relation to uh, carers' allowance. Amendments 133 to 137 seek to improve the government's attempt to fulfil the recommendations made in the stage one report. Um, put simply, my amendments seek to provide a robust transparent framework for uprating benefits. Um, specifically, it would require ministers to consult publicly on regulations which establish an uprating system. It requires those regulations to set out the mechanism, the frequency and the form of assistance to be uprated. Um, but crucially, it requires ministers to draft, consult and agree a system um, of these requirements before uprating um, starts to, to take place. Um, and I would ask members to support uh, the amendments, um, all amendments in this group in my name. Thank you, Mr Griffin. Could I invite Ms Johnson to speak to Amendment 2 and the other amendments in the group? Yeah, um, thank you, Convener. Um, amendment 2 provides for an operating mechanism that applies to all the forms of assistance the Bill outlines. The amendment is closely based on the provisions of the 1992 Social Security Administration Act, which provides for operating of many of the current reserve benefits. It asks ministers to ascertain whether the value of any form of assistance has changed relative to the general level of relevant prices and then uprate the benefits accordingly. What the relevant price is, general living costs, the cost of energy bills, the cost of funerals, and how that's calculated is left to ministers. I'm not trying to tie ministers down to a specific index of inflation, for example. But I do believe this is an very important principle. When assistance is provided, it should be at a rate adequate for the purpose for which it is paid. If there's a change in the cost that the assistance covers, then the rate of assistance should increase with it. Um, dignity and respect are rightly forming the basis of the new system, and there's a link between dignity and respect and the adequacy of the assistance being paid. A system which pays relative to increasing prices less and less every year is not a system which respects recipients and offers them that dignity. 
And according to research commissioned by this committee, by 2020, £300 million is being cut from 700,000 Scots households because the UK government has set aside the requirement on it to upgrade benefits. This is £450 per year for each household, on top of all the other cuts being made. Um, for example, Sure Start Maternity Grant has only been uprated once since it began, and so the value of these payments has been dropping every year while other prices increase, as Maternity Action argued in a submission to our predecessor committee, the Welfare Reform Committee. And whilst the Minister has made a range of very welcome improvements in the new Best Start Grant, I would ask her to comment on whether she would consider uprating Best Start as prices changed. Now, this is particularly crucial, given that we now have statutory child poverty targets. I very much appreciate that the Minister does recognise the issue and is offering her own amendments. They are a good start and an improvement on the original draft of the Bill, but they don't create a requirement to uprate all assistance. The requirement is for disability assistance, and there is a requirement only to consider the issue for other forms of assistance and not to uprate. So the Bill is setting up a system which could be radically different to the one it replaces, and one way it can do that is to ensure a guaranteed, reliable, real terms, minimum payment each year, and that is what my amendment too seeks to achieve, and I, I move the amendment. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms Johnson. Do any other members wish to come in in this grouping? No, can I invite the Minister to wind up? Thank you, Convener. Um, my amendments on, on uprating put our policy commitment to uprate disability and employment injury assistance on a statutory footing. I'm happy, as I said, to support uh, Mr Griffin's amendments 48A, B and C to extend that com commitment to carers' assistance. My amendments also take into account the committee's recommendations. They provide the flexibility to take different decisions for different types of assistance in line with the wider budget-setting process of the Scottish Government. With respect to Ms Johnson's amendments, I believe my amendments respond most directly to this committee's stage one recommendation. Mr Griffin's amendments 133 to 137 would result in a bureaucratic process that would take a significant amount of time when actually what is needed by those relying on this financial support is a quick and clear process. Uprating should be a routine procedure that does not require massive machinery behind it. I urge the committee to reject these amendments and to support the amendments in my name. Thank you, Minister. The question is that Amendment 47 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I call Amendment 48 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 47, and ask the Minister to formally move. Formally moved. I call Amendment 48A in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 47, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 48A be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call Amendment 48B in the name of Mark Griffin, already amendment uh, debated with Amendment 47, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Move. The question is that Amendment 48B be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Call Amendment 48C in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 47, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Move. Thank you. Question is, Amendment 48C be agreed. Are we all <laughs> agreed? Yes, thank you. I ask the Minister to press or withdraw Amendment 48. Press. Thank you. The question is, Amendment 48 to be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. The question is that section 45 and 46 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. We now move to the next group, um, Top Up Child Benefit. I call Amendment 202 in the name of Mark Griffin, grouped with Amendments 110 and 111, and ask Mr Griffin to move Amendment 202 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you, Camilla. Um, I move um, Amendment 202. The first test of the child benefit um, policy was before recess when um, that initial amendment was accepted where um, I made the argument that there is a, a place to consult parents who receive child benefit because of the power to top up. And, and following on from that decision of committee, we now move on to the substantive amendments which would put in place the mechanism to top up child benefit and give effect to the Give Me Five campaign call. 
We were debating this amendment in the same week that the Poverty and Inequality Commission published its first report ahead of the Scottish Government's delivery plan for meeting its child poverty targets. And as simply as possible, the, the overwhelming message of that report was that significant use of new social security powers is required if it is going to meet challenging targets to reduce child poverty. And when we um, passed the Child Poverty Act last year, um, we basically said that we refused to turn uh, a blind eye, that the time um, for acting on those sentiments is, is now. And by Easter, the Scottish Government's first Child Poverty Act delivery plan will set out how, in the face of the transition to universal credit, the benefit freeze, and more auster austerity, how we can set a, a different path. But taken together with the provisions for early years assistance, this proposal supplements that policy direction. As families um, across Scotland face inflation of 3%, weighing down on their weekly budgets, uh, with child benefit losing its value um, for another year, this would assist over 500,000 families struggling from the, the impact of Brexit and uh, Tory government-driven austerity. But more importantly, 30,000 children would be lifted out of poverty immediately. Um, the IFS predict that by the time of the next Holyrood elections, one in three children will be in poverty. Now, with the rate resolution passed, we acknowledge that the SNP budget has failed to secure the budget to pass on a top-up in 2018-19, but legislating now could ensure that the provision are commenced in future years, or if in-year revisions can be found this year. I feel that failing to legislate at stage two would be short-sighted, and to delay a decision would also mean that we are content to wait while children suffer in poverty and, and misery with all the associated impacts that has on health and wellbeing, um, educational um, attainment, and future earning potential, and their ability to get themselves out of poverty. A key to the Give Me Five campaign's work is the recognition that the near universal uptake and eligibility criteria of child benefit make this the most appealing option to have the most immediate impact. And the Commission noted in Recommendation 23 that the government must consider, and I quote, the greatest financial impact alongside other relevant factors, such as cost and complexity of delivery, take-up rates, income security, and potential disincentives to move into work or increase earnings in order to identify the most effective option to impact on child poverty. And while committee has passed amendments to deliver a new strategy to boost the uptake, the number eligible for and claiming tax credits has fallen. Topping this up would support fewer and fewer families as Tory welfare reform accelerates. Alongside this, the complexity of topping up the means-tested system, which is going through a, a period of transition, is, is huge. That alternative, topping up child tax credit, would also require the government to top up universal credit and income support for the, for the medium term. And to, quote, to quote the Commission again, doing so would be particularly challenging given the current problems with the way that universal credit is being delivered. The Commission notes that increasing the child element of universal credit appears to be the most cost-effective way of reducing child poverty, assuming a 100% uptake of universal credit. And that, that is, of course, a, an impossibility in the short term. And we won't have an, a clear idea of how and when the full transition to universal credit will take place until the end of this year. But simply, convener, I think that this is the, the most cost-effective and um, best way of lifting as many children out of poverty as we can. Um, and I hope that members will give serious consideration to the, the amendments in this group in my name. Thank you. Can you move Amendment 202, yep, please? Yep, move Amendment 202. Thank you. Um, do any other members wish to come in on this? Um, I'll take Ms Johnson. Um, yeah, um, certainly I'd like to speak in wholehearted support of Mark Griffin's amendments on topping up child benefit. 
Um, I fully support the aims of the Give Me Five campaign. Um, I, I think we're all aware of their work and the efforts they've made to raise awareness of this issue. Um, as Mark Griffin has pointed out, child benefit has decreased markedly in its value um, since welfare reform was introduced. And this £5 top-up would, would probably go a little way to addressing, addressing that. Um, the fact that this measure would lift 30,000 child out of, children out of poverty immediately um, that, that itself will bring around cost savings in terms of their health and well-being. And if we're a country that seriously wants to address the attainment gap, this is something we can't turn away from. And if we're going to hear, as I'm sure we are, arguments against universality, then I would remind um, members of um, other parties that the government is rightly, in my view, committed to that principle when it comes to prescriptions, when it comes to free access to higher education, for the very same reasons that we should support this in this case. We know from Child Poverty Action Group and others that child benefit is often the only income that families are dependent on, such as the complexity of our welfare system. Um, that is well evidenced. I think this would send a really strong message that Scotland is taking this issue very seriously and really wants to, to strive to end child poverty. Um, if we're looking at one in three children living in poverty in the next election, I mean, that is, that is a, a, you know, it's, it's an absolutely horrifying prospect. And I think here, you know, I understand that there are costs attached, but there are real costs attached to not doing it. So again, I would stress the importance of universality there is, there's nothing better we can really be doing than ensuring that our youngest people have the best possible start in life. And I think child benefit, you know, it really is at the heart of that. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Ms. McGuire. Um, colleagues there do make, you know, compelling, emotive, um, emotional arguments um, and quote from the Commission. However, the Commission also says that it's not recommending that the Scottish Government top up a specific benefit. And it points to um, looking at other options as well. I think the bottom line for me is that this framework bill isn't the place to put something that commits um, a substantial amount of money to something and, and rides roughshod over the budget. So I can't support this. Thanks, Ms. McGuire. Mr. Tompkins? Uh, thank you, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful to Mr. Griffin for bringing this important matter to the attention of the committee, and not least because, um, like Mr. Griffin, I think that the Scottish Government's very considerable power to top up reserved benefits is a very important part of devolved uh, social security for which this um, uh, uh, bill is, uh, is legislating. Um, last year, this Parliament unanimously and with all party support passed um, what I think is a very important piece of legislation in the Child Poverty Act, which the Scottish Conservatives, like everybody else, uh, supported and uh, tried to make stronger as the legislation was going through Parliament. And as Mr Griffin said, the first um, delivery plan under um, the Child Poverty Act is shortly to be published by the Scottish Government. Um, and that legislation, very importantly, uh, takes a holistic view, um, it takes a holistic approach to child poverty. It does not think that the only um, uh, relevant measure of child poverty is income, and it does not think that the only solution child to child poverty is uh, increasing the value of, of benefits. We need to think about education and the attainment gap. We need to think about families and work. We need to think about a, a huge variety of issues. We need to think about health and mental health as well when we're thinking about, a when we're thinking about child benefit. Um, and it's, I have to say, I think my uh, friends and colleagues on the political left do need to absorb and confront and reflect on uh, the key finding um, of the Joseph Rentree Foundation in 2016, that increasing the value of benefits without tackling the underlying drivers of poverty has failed to address poverty in the United Kingdom, including in Scotland. This is a, 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 an approach, the approach that is advocated by Mr. Griffin and Ms. Johnston, which according to the Joseph Rentree Foundation has failed to address poverty. If we are serious about child poverty, and we all are, serious about child poverty, then we do need to get serious about addressing its underlying drivers, its underlying pathways, its underlying causes, uh, and not merely focusing on the value uh, of benefits as these amendments do. The final point I would make, absolutely. Well, I think, Mr. Tompkins, I, I, I'm aware in previous amendments and so on, you have you, you suggested that, um, you know, perhaps drug addictions and other issues are, are you know, the causes of poverty. but. Uh, 
do you accept that very often poverty is the cause of those issues themselves? I, I and think, that if sorry. we want to close the attainment gap, um, I think it's very difficult. I, I understand you, you're, you're passionate, as we all are, about education. I think it's very difficult to attain your potential if you simply don't have enough food in the morning or if your family are really struggling. So I, I see the two as entirely interlinked, and I think we should be pushing for both. Not one of the expenses. We, we, we don't. We don't actually disagree uh, about that. I think that, that each can be a cause of the other. I don't think that um, uh, poverty drives the education gap wider any more than I think the education gap uh, drives uh, poverty deeper. I think they are related, deeply interlinked and related to one another. They are causes of each other. They are. They have a correlative re re relationship. My point is that, you're, that none of us is going to be successful as a political party, as an individual campaigner, as a government or as an opposition in tackling child poverty if we only think about increasing the value of benefits. Important though that is, I'm not saying that that is unimportant, um, but it is, I think, a mistake. And in the Joseph Rowntree Foundation's view, it is a mistake to focus on that to the exclusion um, of other uh, broader uh, issues, including education, uh, unemployment, uh, health, and so on and so forth. The final point I wanted to make, convener, about this is that, um, you know, the, the, the um, uh, top-up that is being proposed uh, by the Give Me Five campaign will cost in addition, or would, it will cost in excess of a quarter of a million pounds a year, to say nothing of its administration costs. This is not an insignificant sum. The appropriate time and place for the Scottish Government to consider uh, whether it wants to adopt this as policy, and I hope that you know the Scottish Government does actively consider whether it wants to adopt this as policy, but the appropriate time and place to do that is not in a framework bill legislating for the implementation of devolved social security, it is in the annual budget process. Um, and this, um, these amendments, I'm afraid, cut straight through that budget process and for that reason I think are inappropriate. Thank you, Mr. Tomkins. I'm going to invite the Minister to contribute. Thank you very much, Convener. As members have already noted, on Monday the Poverty and Inequality Commission set up by this government to provide independent expert advice published its advice to guide us as we asked it to in the Child Poverty Delivery Plan that we will publish in the coming weeks. This plan, as members will I'm sure remember, will set out the actions we will take towards meeting the challenging statutory income targets we have set to reduce and ultimately eradicate child poverty. The Commission set out some general principles focused around five themes which should underpin the delivery plan. The most relevant, I believe, for us this morning is this, linking action to impact, being clear what the impact of each action is expected to be and committing to monitoring and evaluating the impact. Convener, the Commission's analysis takes as a starting point the removal of the benefit cap and the two-child limit. It then models on top of that various benefit options. The package to top up child benefit by five pounds would cost 340 million and would lift 20,000 children out of poverty. But a package to top up the child element of universal credit at a cost of 360 million would lift 45,000 children out of poverty. There can be little doubt that using resources in a way that delivers relatively small impacts on child poverty is not the most effective targeted action to take. So it is clear that whilst a universal £5 top-up to child benefit is not a bad idea, it is certainly not the best idea. Further analysis also demonstrates clearly that for every £10 spent in that way on this particular uh, option, only £3 would effectively reach those children living in poverty. The analysis in the Commission's report is clear in pointing to the most effective use of any additional resources that could be found and committed to this work. The Commission is not recommending that we top up a specific benefit, but helpfully points to the analysis as providing a direction of travel in terms of which options are worth exploring further. The Commission also, helpfully and pragmatically, advises that consideration should be given to issues such as cost and complexity of delivery, not insubstantial, potential take-up rates, income security, and potential disincentives to move into work or increase earnings, all of that alongside impact. The £340 million the Commission analysis indicates to be the cost of implementing the child benefit top-up package is roughly equivalent to the combined current spending in Scotland of winter fuel payment, industrial injury benefits, DHPs, severe disablement allowance and funeral expense assistance. 
This points to the difficult decisions to be made in determining how a declining Scottish budget can most effectively be used. Difficult decisions that we all need to take responsibility to make and, has been said, are properly made through the Government and the Parliament's budget process system. Convener, this is not a competition about who is most committed to ending child poverty. There can be absolutely no doubt of my colleagues' commitment in that regard or of this Government's commitment and intention to take effective action to meet the challenging targets we have set. Effective action across government and in addition to that which we are already committed to and are taking. Convener, the Independent Expert Poverty and Inequality Commission has provided all of us with clear and helpful advice. It sets out a direction of travel and points to the further thinking that needs to be done. We will take that forward through our child poverty delivery plan, laying out the extent to which we will use social security powers to reduce power child poverty and the options before us. That is the right approach to take, the approach the Parliament agreed this Government should take, and I would urge the Committee to reject these amendments precisely because they do not meet a key guiding principle the Commission has identified as critical in underpinning our effective action. Thank you, Minister. Can I invite Mr Griffin to wind up and to press or withdraw his amendment? Thank you, Camina. I take on board all the points that members of the committee have made. Um, firstly, in relation to um, whether this is the right way of doing this, whether this cuts across um, the budget or not, um, my view is that I'm happy to ride roughshod over the Scottish Government budget if this lifts 30,000 children out of poverty, and I would do that every single day of the week. Um, Mr Tompkins' point in relation to um, whether increasing benefits is the, the best lever to reduce poverty or not is, is an argument we've had um, regularly. But the fact is we're debating the, the social security bill, so we're talking about the, the benefit system. I don't agree, disagree with Mr Tompkins that there are other ways of lifting um, families out of poverty. And on a lot of those measures, um, there will be common ground, but we're talking about the, the social security system, so we're focused on um, how measures within that will, will help families, will help lift children out of, of poverty, and certainly um, a benefits freeze will certainly not lift a single family um, out of poverty, and these amendments um, go towards addressing the, the benefits freeze that has been in place um, from the UK put in place by the UK Tory government. What I am looking at, um, like the, the minister said, um, action to impact, and um, the action taken today if these amendments um, passed would be to increase, um, to top up child benefit. The impact would be 30,000 children lifted out of poverty and I agree again that this is not a competition. We're not competing with each other to see who wants to reduce poverty um, the most because we all equally want to reduce child poverty. But this is not a competition because there aren't competing proposals. There is one proposal here on the table. Um, if the government had wanted to, to bring forward proposals um, and detail them and set them out in the budget, then that's something that I would have welcomed, but there is no competition. There is one proposal here. Um, it's a proposal to increase child benefit by five pounds a week, um, paid universally in the simplest, easiest way, um, not completely universal since those um, earning over the earnings limit don't qualify for child benefit. So not entirely universal, still an element of, of targeting. Um, and I would ask um, members to support um, give serious, serious consideration to the, the amendments that are tabled in my name in this group and support um, all of them. Uh, can I, you confirm if you're pressing? Uh, you press amendment. amendment 202. Thank you, Mr Griffin. The question is that amendment 202 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. Uh, I'll take a, a vote. Those in favour of amendment 202, please raise your hands. Those against? Those abstaining?
The result of the division is two votes for, six votes against. Um, therefore, the amendment is not agreed. The question is that section 47 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Um, call amendment 101 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with amendment 102, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. One ten. Sorry, did I say one? My apologies. Amendment one one zero in the name of Mark Griffin. Already debated with Amendment two hundred two, and ask Mr. Griffin to move or not move. Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment one one zero be agreed. Are we all agreed? Uh, we are not agreed. There will be a division. Can I ask those in favour to please raise their hands? Those against? Any abstentions? Thank you. The result of the division are two votes for, six votes again, against, therefore the amendment is not agreed. I call amendment 111 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with amendment 202. Mr Griffin, to move or not move? Move. The question is that amendment 111 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Uh, we are not agreed. There will be a division. Can those in favour of 111 please raise their hands? Those against? Any abstentions? Thank you. Um, the result of the division are two votes for, six votes against. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The question is that section 48 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. We now move to the next group of amendments, which is in inalienability of assistance. And I call amendment 190 in the name of the minister, group with amendment 199, and ask the minister to move amendment 198 and speak to both amendments. Thank you, convener. Uh, as you've said, amendments 198 and 199 uh, set out the general principle of inalienability of social security assistance and our technical adjustments. This effectively means that a person's right to social security assistance will be protected and cannot be transferred to a third party for debt recovery. Amendment 198 therefore makes it clear that creditors cannot use legal mechanisms to assume the right to a person's benefit payments, which could be used to recover a debt. Amendment 199 sets out if, that if a person enters an insolvency process, there is a further safeguard to ensure their assistance cannot be used to pay off creditors. These are important amendments that will ensure that people get what they are entitled to and that the assistance provided meets the needs for which it was intended. I move Amendment 198 in my name. Thank you, Minister. Does anyone wish to contribute to this debate? Um, Minister, do you wish to wind up? Uh, formally, can be Thank, Thank you. Thank you. The question is that one, Amendment 198 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call Amendment 199 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 198 and ask the Minister to move formally. Move formally. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 199 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. We will now move to the next group uh, on information sharing and I call Amendment 200 in the name of the Minister, group with Amendment 201. I ask the Minister to move Amendment 200 and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Amendments 200 and 201 are technical adjustments to make provision in the Bill for data sharing between Ministers and Scottish public authorities. The Scotland Act 2016 contains provision for data sharing between Scottish ministers and the UK government for social security functions. Additional gateways for data sharing need to be created so that ministers can share information with Scottish public authorities. Amendment 200 lists the main public authorities that ministers may need information from to operate social security provision. There is a power to add further bodies by regulations. I would highlight that any requirement on these bodies to supply information will not override any prohibition in any other enactment or rule of law. This is to ensure that the gateway the Bill will create is compatible with wider requirements of data protection legislation. These amendments also provide a gateway in the other direction to allow Ministers to supply Social Security information to Scottish public authorities, for example, to help with the automation of benefits. To ensure transparency, regulations will have to set out which functions of the authority receiving the information are relevant. Again, this is subject to any other enactment or rule of law that would prohibit disclosure. I move the amendment in my name. 
Thank you, Minister. Does anyone else wish to contribute to this debate? Mr. Tompkins. Just very briefly, can I just ask them? I mean, I, I think, I mean, I, as I understand it, these um, amendments are, are technical and um, have been checked um, by government lawyers for compatibility with um, UK and EU data protection requirements. But just, and I hesitate to say this, but just in the light of the fact that um, uh, within the last uh, year or two, there has been an adverse Supreme Court ruling against legislation passed by this parliament on precisely the issue of information sharing. Can the minister say anything about how um, these amendments are compatible with that um, interpretation of data protection um, and are, are different from the way in which the named persons legislation, which is obviously what I'm talking about, um, con constructed um, requirements to, to share I information? Um, I, I can um, assure Mr. Tompkins that these amendments have been drafted in order to take account of that uh, court ruling. Uh, the precise way um, in which they are different, uh, I'm not in a position to uh, draw to his attention. I would be happy to do uh, so otherwise outside the committee, but I am happy on the record to say that these amendments are compatible with that court ruling. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oh, sorry. Um, Ms Johnson, did you want to come in? Yes, if, if I might. I'm just, you know, I do have some... Yeah, just a question for the Minister. For example, in um, Amendment 200... Um, point number three, uh, if the Minister could just confirm what is meant by where information is supplied to the Scottish Ministers uh, under subsection one for use for any purpose, they may use it for any other purposes for which information held by them for that purpose may be used. Could the Minister, I, I, I just do have concerns about the extents to which information is going to be shared under this amendment. Yeah, thank, thank you, um, and thank you, Ms Johnson, for that question. Um, it may well be that the manner in which this is worded um, is, is a standard wording for such a clause, uh, but I think we've touched on this before, where we uh, come up against um, what, with the greatest of respect, I might describe as legal speak, uh, which is not always as clear as our legal colleagues um, feel uh, it is to them. Uh, what this means is, of course, that in all of this, uh, data that this agency uh, holds can only be used for the purposes that we seek the approval of the individual whose data it is to hold, if, if you follow me. Mm -hmm. So uh, if the agency wants to hold data about me, I have to give it approval and it has to be clear with me uh, the purposes for which it wants to hold that information. Uh, and so my consent is uh, a, an absolute requirement, which I, I hope is what would provide uh, Ms Johnson with the assurance that she seeks. Thank you. Minister, is there anything else you want to contribute to the uh, No, thank you. I'm up? happy to uh, conclude formally. Thank you. Um, the question is that Amendment 200 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No, um, we are not agreed. There will be a division. Uh, can those in favour please raise their hands? Those against? Those abstaining. Thank you. Thank you. The result of the division are seven votes for, none against, and one abstention. Therefore, the amendment is agreed. I call Amendment 161 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 152 and ask the Minister to move formally. Move formally. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 161 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. I call Amendment 133 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 47, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 133 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. There, we are not agreed. There will be a division. Can I ask those in favour of Amendment 133 to please raise their hands? Those against? Those abstaining. Thank you. The result of the division are two votes for and six votes against, with no abstentions. Therefore, the amendment is not agreed. 
I call Amendment 134 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 47, ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Move. The question is that Amendment 134 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour of 134, please raise your hands. Those against? Any abstentions? The result of the division are two votes for, six votes against. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 135 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 47, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Move. The question is that Amendment 135 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Uh, we are not agreed. Can those in favour of 135 please raise their hands? Those against? Any abstentions? The result of the division are two votes for, six votes against, and it's therefore not agreed. So I call Amendment 136 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 47, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Move. Uh, the question is that 136 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Sorry, can I take that again? Are we all agreed? No. no. no thank you. Um, uh, those in favour of Amendment 136, please raise your hands. Those against? Okay. The result of the division are two votes for, six against, no abstentions. It is therefore not agreed. We are about to move to um, the next group of discretionary housing payments. Before that, I would like to have a five-minute um, comfort break. I would request members be back in their seats within five minutes, if at all possible. Thank you very much.
We will now move to the next group um, of group of amendments, discretionary housing payments. I call Amendment 209 in the name of Pauline McNeill, grouped with Amendments 162, 163 and 164. And I invite Mr Griffin to move Amendment 209 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you, Camilla. I move Amendment 209 in the name of Pauline McNeill. Um, this amendment was drafted with the intention of ensuring that the existence um, of DHP schemes um, are mandatory. Um, an issue that Citizens Advice Scotland raised with the committee at stage one. In no way would we seek to mandate the operation of that scheme or place duties to pay assistance, which would indeed take the discretion of operation out of the hands of local government. Um, I think I would accept that the duty to operate a scheme should have um, perhaps been a standalone amendment, um, a standalone amendment, and perhaps we, um, Ms McNeill could discuss that with the, the minister ahead of stage three, um, but we will be supporting. Or I'll be supporting the the amendments in the name of the minister. Thank you. Can I invite the minister to speak to Amendment One Six Two and to the other amendments in the group? Thank you, convener. Um, one Six Two is a technical adjustment. <clears throat> excuse me to make clear on the face of the bill that it is possible for discretionary housing payments to be paid either to an individual or to a person to whom the individual has a liability. In practice, this is likely to be their landlord, and the amendment also clarifies that for a local authority landlord, the payment may be made by a transfer between the authority's accounts, which allows the current practice to continue. In its Stage 1 report, the committee invited the government to reflect on the evidence received on DHPs. Amendments 163 and 164 respond to suggestions from local authorities and other stakeholders that local authorities should be under a duty to run DHP schemes where there is funding from the Scottish Government for them to do so. Uh, Ms McNeill's amendment, uh, in my view, is unworkable. The Government's amendments provide that a local authority must consider applications but retains discretion as to who should receive an award. This is fundamental to the nature of existing discretionary housing payment schemes. Ms McNeill's amendments would have the effect of creating an entitlement-based system uh, so that all qualifying applicants must receive an award. This would go against the discretionary nature of the scheme. Uh, whilst I'm sure that may not be the intent, I would therefore urge that this amendment is not supported. The Government's amendments will ensure that DHP schemes will continue to be run in all Scottish local authorities, therefore continuing to provide essential to su support. I hope that members will be able to support my amendments and reject those uh, proposed by Ms McNeill. Thank you, Minister. Do any other members wish to contribute to this debate? No. Um, can I invite Mr Griffin to wind up and to press or withdraw his amendment? Thank you, Camina. As the Minister set out, that was... Um, certainly not the intent behind the amendment lodged in the, the name of Paul McNeill and on that basis seek committee's permission to withdraw. A committee content that that be withdrawn. Thank you. Um, I now call amendment 162 in the name of the minister already debated with amendment 209 and ask the minister to move formally. Move formally. Thank you. The question is that amendment 162 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. question is that section 49 be agreed. Are we all agreed? And the question is that section 50 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Call amendment 163 in the name of the minister already debated with amendment 209 and ask the minister to move formally. Move formally. Thank you. The question is that amendment 163 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. The question is that section 51 be agreed. Are we all agreed? And the question is that section 52 be agreed. Are we all agreed? I call Amendment 164 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 209, and ask the Minister to move formally. Moved formally. The question is that Amendment 164 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. The question is that Section 53 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Call Amendment 2 in the name of Alison Johnson, already debated with Amendment 47, and ask Ms Johnson to move or not move. Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 2 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes? No. No. no? no, sir. So we are not agreed, so there will be a division. Um, can I um, ask those in favour of Amendment 2 to please raise their hands? Those against? Any abstentions? Um, 
So the result of the division are two votes for, six votes against, with no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. We now move to the next group, which is universal credit payment to joint claimants. And I call amendment 203 in the name of Mark Griffin in a group on its own and ask Mr Griffin to move and speak to amendment 203. Thank you, Commissioner. I move amendment 203 in my name. Um, the amendment seeks to place in law a requirement on ministers to bring forward regulations under section 30 of the Scotland Act, which ensures that payments of universal credit are automatically split between uh, both members of a couple, allowing an opt-out should a couple wish to retain a joint payment. The amendment transposes the restrictions included in the Scotland Act, but crucially would ensure that the use of a regulation for the third universal credit flexibility is done in a way which has overwhelming support from individuals and organisations, and indeed the Minister's colleague, uh, Philippa Whitford. In recent question responses, the Minister said um, a year after the Cabinet Secretary first pro promised progress in this area that officials are discussing with the DWP the feasibility, operational and co cost implications of these different policy um, options. And as much as I, was, as I would want it to, this amendment doesn't require ministers to rush to establish a split payment scheme within the next year. Now, of course, those regulations which the minister can lay may have a later implementation date, and the amendment rightly requires that the minister to continue um, the consultation with the DWP. Um, that is itself a requirement of the power in the Scotland Act. Um, but the Scotland Act is, is very clear that if Scottish ministers make regulations and the Secretary of State considers that it is not practicable, practicable to implement a change um, made by the regulations by that time, and that change um, is to start to have effect, the Secretary of State may delay them to amend to a more reasonable date. And this would deliver the same intention as Philip uh, Whitford's private members bill, which is due to have its second reading in mid-March. At the, the first reading of the Universal Credit Application Advice um, and Assistance, Mitz Whitford said, uh, the bill calls on the government to make separate payments to the norm. It's often said that Universal Credit should be like a salary, but salaries are paid to individuals, and it's quite Victorian to go back to the idea of the breadwinner. I certainly would not be too chuffed if my salary was posted to my husband. And I fully agree with that statement. In the consultation on social security, there was, an old, there was overwhelming support for universal credit payments to be split between the members of a household from 99% of organisations and 78% of individuals. And 74% believe payments should be split automatically. The key stakeholders, including Engender, Scottish Women's Aid, Joseph Rowntree Foundation, Inclusion Scotland, SCVO and SFHA, advocate automatic use of, of this flexibility. Um, as we've been, um, as we've rehearsed, I think quite frequently, automatically splitting would aid gender equality in the, so the Scottish social security system by promoting financial autonomy and helping to protect women and children from financial and domestic abuse. And the situation as it stands is that nine in 10 domestic abuse cases include a, a financial element. Women receive 20% of their incomes from social security payments and 86% of UK government cuts to social security will come from, from women's incomes. It's split me Split payments can be requested under the current system, but they are massively underused and underpublicised. And I would ask members to support um, the amendments in my name. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. Do any members wish to come in on this group? No. Oh, Ms. Johnson here. Um, yeah, just very briefly to speak in support of Mark Griffin's amendments. I think this is um, a very important amendment. Um, I, I think the this flexibility is absolutely essential for the the reasons that Mr Griffin outlines and you know there are there's support out there from a considerable number of groups who have real concerns about the impact of you know a payment to the so-called head of a household and uh, the power that that can give one person in certain circumstances is something that we should seek to avoid so I think this is a really important amendment that I'll be pleased to support. 
Thank you. Can I invite uh, Mr. Adam? Mr. Chairman, but I just feel I must, uh, from the point of view, from the practical point of view, that uh, this is the DWP that has to do this in itself, and for the Scottish government to do it, and they have to negotiate with the DWP in order to do that. And also, uh, do we know if the DWP have the IT systems in place to be able to do that properly and ensure that they can do this as well? So the problem we have is that there's so many imponderables for us here to be able to do that, that it makes it extremely difficult, in my opinion, for the Scottish Government to do that. It would be interesting to hear what the Minister has to say in our summing up. Okay, can I invite the Minister to contribute? Thank you very much, Convener. Um, there can be no doubt of this Government's view that the UK Government's policy of making a single payment of universal credit to a household can increase inequality in the welfare system and act as an enabler for domestic abuse or financial coercion by one partner towards another. Let me, for the record, restate the Scottish Government's clear commitment to introduce split payments to universal credit for the people living in Scotland, a strong commitment that we are already progressing. But I cannot support Mr Griffin's amendment. Firstly, there is not an overriding consensus among stakeholders for an automatic split of the universal credit award as proposed in the amendment. There are different views on the issue, as well as how the different elements of universal credit award should be allocated. We are currently undertaking further work jointly with stakeholders and users of the universal credit system to examine what the impacts would be. But perhaps most importantly, delivery is entirely dependent on the Department for Work and Pensions. Universal credit is reserved to the UK government and like the Universal Credit Scottish Choices, the DWP would deliver any split payments that the Scottish Government requires. Um, I uh, hear Mr Griffin uh, make reference to Ms Whitford's bill in uh, Westminster, but I do not believe it can be paid in aid of this amendment, since Ms Whitford rightly addresses her bill to the Government with responsibility for this reserved benefit. I hope she succeeds in her endeavours, but I would respectfully suggest to Mr Griffin that if he wishes this government to act in that way, as he outlines, then I hope he will support our arguments for further powers in terms of the devolution of additional benefits. This means it will not be solely for the Scottish Government to decide what can be achieved, and a set deadline is therefore unhelpful. We are completely reliant on what is technically feasible within the DWP's IT systems. So we need to agree with the DWP a delivery date that it is confident it can meet and negotiate a cost which represents good value for money for the Scottish taxpayer coming out as that cost would do from the fixed envelope towards the delivery of the devolved social security powers. Discussions with the DWP are ongoing and it is an iterative process this amendment would write a blank cheque for the negotiations on costs. So while the Scottish Government is committed to the policy, can I repeat, deliverability is completely in the hands of the DWP. In summary, I would reiterate that I share Mr Griffin's concerns about the DWP policy that his amendment touches on. But I hope that he will agree uh, that his proposition uh, would preempt the outcome of uh, our process would hand the DWP a blank cheque and could not be delivered by this government since it fails to recognise a reserved benefit, a reserved benefit as a result of the agreement of the Smith Commission to which his party was a party. Uh, I hope he would support additional devolved powers to this government, but right at the moment, the deliverability rests with the re uh, holder of the reserve benefit, which is the UK government acting through the DWP in its name. And I would ask members to oppose this amendment. Thank you, Minister. Can I invite Mr Griffin to wind up and to press or withdraw his amendment? Thank you, Convener. Um, this amendment in itself doesn't set any timescale on the government to bring forward or to, to enact um, a split payments. It, the only timescale that this amendment sets out is um, that Scottish ministers must bring forward regulation um, within one year of royal assent. The regulation doesn't necessarily need to immediately um, make automatic split payments a reality. There is flexibility um, within the amendment, as, as I have um, worded. Now, 
I'm committed to this policy of automatically splitting um, payments through universal credit. I think the, the government is committed to the policy um, of split payments. And so I don't take the argument that the Minister makes that this amendment um, gives the DWP a, a, a blank cheque. The fact that we are all committed or that there is a majority in Parliament committed to this policy effectively is telling the DWP that we want this to happen and we expect um, them to deliver. And we're effectively already giving them a blank cheque. We can uh, demand anything we like from the DWP, but if the DWP don't want to actually listen to this place, and they, they have, we have to negotiate in order to do anything. They, 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 are, they have to listen to Westminster. So what, I do not see the point in his argument. The Scottish, part, the Scottish Government has the power to introduce flexibilities. Um, that needs to be negotiated with the DWP. There's nothing in this amendment which stops the government from entering into these negotiations. And as I set out in the opening arguments, um, if there is anything that um, the DWP doesn't feel or the government doesn't feel um, they're able to meet within that timescale, the Secretary of State can then amend to, to set a new timetable in place. Um, I feel that the amendment as it, as it stands would um, put into effect the policy that most, um, I think, round the table agree with that automatic split payments um, should be um, something that, that we would want to achieve and to, to put it into this legislation and would be a, a welcome step and I will press the amendment in my name. Okay. Thank you Mr Griffin. The question is that amendment 203 be agreed. Are we all agreed? There will be a division. Can those in favour of 203 please raise their hands? <coughs> those against? Any abstentions? The result of the division are two votes for, six votes against. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The question is that section 54 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. I call amendment 75 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with amendment 8, and ask Mr Balfour to move or not move. Uh, not move. Thank you. I call amendment 150 in the name of Polly McNeill, already debated with amendment 141, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Come from. Can we just uh, debated with amendment 141, which. Approval by regulation. Um, move. Okay, uh, the question is that 150 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. Um, there will be a division. Can those in favour of 150 please raise their hands? And those against? Any abstentions? The result of the division are two vo votes for, four against and two abstentions. The amendment is therefore disagreed. Can I call amendment 51 in the name of Alison Johnson, already debated with amendment 4, and ask Ms Johnson to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. Call amendment 49 in the name of the Minister, already debated with amendment 15, and ask the Minister to move formally. Move formally. The question is that amendment 49 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Call Amendment 50 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 61 and ask the Minister to move formally. Moved formally. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 50 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Call Amendment 151 in the name of Pauline McNeill already debated with Amendment 149 and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. 151. Yeah. Um, move. Okay. The question is that Amendment 151 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Uh, there's division. Those in favour of 151, please raise your hands. Those against? Any abstentions? The result of the division are two votes for, four votes against and two abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 76 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with Amendment 64, and ask Mr Balfour to move or not move. I not move. Thank you. I call Amendment 130 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated with Amendment 119, and ask Mr Tompkins to move or not move. Not move. 
Thank you. Call Amendment 172 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 207, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Not move. Okay. Call Amendment 192 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 82, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Not move. Call Amendment 165 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 152, and ask the Minister to move formally. Moved formally. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 165 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Call Amendment 137 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 47, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Move. The question is that Amendment 137 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. Um, there will be division. Can those in favour of 137 please raise their hands? And those against? Any abstentions? The result of the division are two votes for, six votes against. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment three in the name of Alison Johnson, already debated with amendment 47, and ask Ms Johnson to move or not move. Not move. Okay. Call amendment 210 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with amendment 204, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Move. Okay, the question is that Amendment 210 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes, we are agreed. Thank you. I call Amendment 52 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 33, and ask the Minister to move formally. Moved formally. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 52 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. I call Amendment 201 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 200, and ask the Minister to move formally. Moved formally. And the question is that Amendment 201 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. I call Amendment 53 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 15, and ask the Minister to move formally. Moved formally. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 53 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. I call Amendment 54 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 15, and ask the Minister to move formally. Moved formally. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 54 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. The question is that Section 55 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Okay. Now move to the next group of amendments, which is Procedure for Regulations for Assistance, and I call Amendment 131 in the name of the Minister, Grouped with amendments 131B, 131A, 132 and 211. And I point out that if amendment 131B is agreed to, you cannot call amendment 131A as there is a preemption. So I invite the Minister to move amendment 131 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, convener. Uh, I am glad that the final stage, uh, final debate in stage two is indeed an important one. We all recognise that getting the process right for scrutinising regulations is very important. That is why, before the bill was even introduced, I met with this committee and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee to invite views on what extra scrutiny requirements would be appropriate and how they should fit with the Parliament's usual processes. What this committee called for in its Stage 1 report is a super-affirmative procedure that would give an independent expert body an opportunity to feed its views into the scrutiny of regulations to help the government and the parliament ensure that our social security law is the best that it can be. I'm therefore pleased to bring Amendment 131 in my name, which alongside the amendment setting up the new commission, gives full effect to this committee's recommendation. And I take again the opportunity to thank Dr McCormick and uh, Ms Patterson and the other members of the Expert Advisory Group for their work in this regard. Members will have received the policy paper the government has issued explaining in detail the effect of the government's amendments. But to briefly summarise, Amendment 131 would create a process for the scrutiny of regulations that deal with eligibility and entitlements under the assistant types in Part 2 of the Bill, and any top-up assistance created under Part 3. The first step of the process is that the Scottish Ministers must inform the Commission of their proposals, notify the par Parliament that they have done so, and make the proposals publicly available. This would also allow for consultation with experienced panels and other groups, as this Government has done throughout the Bill process. Members will recall that it is one of the Bill's principles that the system will be designed with the people of Scotland. 
It also provides an opportunity for the Parliament to become engaged with proposals at the consultation, consultation stage if it wishes. The next stage of the process is that the Independent Commission must prepare a report on the draft regulations in which it sets out its observations and recommendations. In performing this work, the Commission will be under a statutory duty to take into account the principles and any relevant international human rights instruments. Once this independent report is published, ministers can lay their draft regulations before the Parliament for approval. Alongside the draft regulations, they will also have to lay a report before the Parliament explaining what they have and have not done in response to any recommendations the Commission has made. With the benefit of having seen the Independent Expert Commission's report and the Government's response, it is then for this Parliament to decide whether or not to approve the Government's regulations and what steps the Parliament might wish to take in getting towards that decision. There are two situations where this procedure does not need to be followed. One is if the draft regulations are for the purpose of consolidating existing regulations. The other is if the Commission advises that its scrutiny is not, in its opinion, required. I know that the Delegated Powers Committee has written to you expressing concern about that last point, and as the Government's position paper makes clear, if members would prefer the Commission not to have that power, the Government will be happy to remove it at Stage 3. Amendment 132 in my name would accept funeral expense assistance regulations and early years assistance regulations from the process I have just outlined until such time as the Commission advises that it is ready to begin carrying out its scrutiny role. This is to avoid delay in the implementation of these benefits by the summer 2019. As the Committee knows, the policy proposals for these types of assistance have been and are being consulted on extensively. We published illustrative regulations last year and public, further public consultation on draft regulations will take place this year. Against that background, it seems unnecessary to hold up implementation until the Commission is operating. Although I should reiterate, it does of course remain for this Committee to determine the role that it wants to take in the scrutiny of those draft regulations when they are laid. Amendment 131B in the name of Ms McNeill seeks to extend superaffirmative procedure to all regulations made under the powers in both this bill and the Welfare Fund Scotland Act 2015. This is, in my view, disproportionate and unnecessary, and I also believe that the amendment is technically flawed. The scrutiny procedure attached to regulation-making powers has to be chosen with an eye to the importance of the regulations in question and the need to preserve and make effective use of parliamentary time. That is what the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee considers when it scrutinises bills. And unsurprisingly, it has not recommended that all regulations under the powers in the bill and the Welfare Funds Act be subject to the affirmative procedure, much less the super affirmative procedure. The effect of Amendment 131B would be that even commencement regulations, which are normally subject to a laying requirement only, would be subject to the super affirmative procedure. While it would be, I'm sure, a pleasure for me to appear before this committee on a weekly basis to go through every regulation with you, I am not sure that that is how you want to spend the most effective use of your time. I cannot support Amendment 211 in the name of Mr Griffin. It would let a judge strike down regulations approved by a vote in this Parliament on the basis that, in the judge's opinion, the policy behind the regulations is retrogressive, without providing a definition of what is retrogressive or any other circumstances surrounding that decision. Whether a particular policy is or is not retrogressive is, in effect, a political judgment. It is precisely the sort of judgment that we've all been elected to this Parliament to make. I am sure Mr Griffin does not want to abdicate his responsibility as a member of this Parliament to the courts. I do not think that is appropriate. An Amendment 211 would diminish the role of the Parliament. I would urge members, therefore, not to support it uh, and to reject that amendment and support the amendments in my name. Thank you, Minister. Um, there is an amendment in the name of Polly Neal. 131B, and I would invite Mr Griffin to move Amendment 131B and speak to the amendments in the group. Can we do I need to formally move 
um, 131B because yeah. it wouldn't be my intention to, to press. If you could formally move and we'll seek to withdraw. Okay, uh, formally move uh, 131B uh, then. Um, and speaking to the amendments in, in the group, um, Amendment 211 in my name is simply a, a probing amendment, which I will also not um, be pressing, and that was to, um, to start um, a debate um, around this issue. And in, in some respect, um, this amendment returns the debate surrounding the bill to where uh, stage one deliberations began, um, focusing on the ability of future governments to erode the assistance being made available to an individual and debating how we can prevent that happening. And throughout the, the passage of this bill, committee has heard and debated um, again and again that there is a balance to be struck between primary and secondary legislation. And while I think there, there has been substantial improvements in by way of the super affirmative procedure and the establishment of the Commission, in which is bound to act in line with international treaties, on the right to social security. Uh, the bill still allows future governments to make fundamental changes to key social security benefits through secondary legislation. And while the Commission will be able to warn of potential breaches of human rights in proposed legislation and aid parliamentary scrutiny, the potential for fundamental changes to be made to social security by regulation alone remains. Um, Child Poverty Action Group of sponsored this amendment so that a line is drawn to ensure that fundamental change should not be brought through primary legislation, if it should be brought through primary legislation, not secondary legislation, and that the bill makes the uh, requisite distinction. Uh, this amendment seeks to draw the line where government proposals would reduce rights under international human rights provisions, and this would have the effect that such retrogressive measures could not be bought, brought by regulations. Um, a government which believed the measure to be... Yep, certainly. Um, I just, what would you believe the definition of retrogressive to be? As I said, this is it was simply a probing amendment, it, not something I intend on pressing. It was something to get a debate around um, whether we feel the balance is right on primary and secondary legislation, whether... Um, the, to have a debate today to see whether we could agree on um, a form of working in advance of stage three, that any um, effect to reduce um, the amount that is paid, any uh, effort to reduce the entitlement um, of a particular benefit would be seen as retrogressive in reducing someone's in right to social security, that then any negative change would have to be brought forward through primary legislation rather than uh, secondary. That is the, the meaning behind the, the amendment and um, the debate that I think um, I wanted to have today. May I just briefly come back in? I, I suppose it's part of the challenge of raising things that are sponsored elsewhere rather than as, as a committee member. I, I, feel, I feel a bit uncomfortable with it and I, and I think it's important to have those definitions and know exactly what we're talking about because as you've communicated it to me there, what, what pops into my head is what if we were reducing something in one sense but creating a whole new other benefit for that same client group? So th I think it's hugely problematic. Um, yeah, I, I, accept, I accept everything that you're saying and that it is hugely prom problematic and that's why I'm not pressing. Um, this is about having a, a debate around it at the, mm -hmm. the table today. Um, and um, I think I would just conclude there, uh, Convener. Thank you, Mr Griffin. Can I invite Mr Tomkins to speak to Amendment 131A and the other amendments? In the I'm group. not moving it because the, it relates to a, a provision that um, has not been accepted. Thank you, Mr Tomkins. Mr Griffin, do you wish to speak to your own amend the amendment in your name, 211? Yep, that's what I was just doing. Yep. Yeah, yeah great. so you don't want to come back in? No, no thanks. Th thank you very much. Uh, any other members wish to contribute? Uh, Mr. Adam, I, I'm I'm concerned with 131B and and with 211. I'm not convinced by in 211 with uh, Mr. Griffin's argument, and uh, also with 131B. The the whole idea, of, as much as I dearly love the minister, I haven't to come here every single week for the slightest leg of regulation. I think it's just not a good use of all of our times. And see, yes, uh huh. 
Yep. I'm accepting everything that he's saying, and on that basis, not pressing either what, amendments. What I'm going to add is, because we have so much coming back uh, at stage three, and we've got so much work to do, I think things like this, I would be pushing it to the vote. Yep. Uh, just to actually get to the stage, I would be pushing uh, 131B and also 211 to the vote so that we could deal with it now and it gives us the opportunity at a later date in yeah. stage three to deal with all the other work we have to deal with. Can I, can I just say, Camina, I completely agree with what Mr Adams just said. Do, I. <laughs> um, do any other members wish to come in? Can, can I invite the Minister to wind up on Amendment 131? Uh, Thank you, convener. If, if I may just take a moment, I think I, I don't need to say much more on my own amendments. If I just can take a moment uh, with respect to Amendment 211. Um, I think Amendment 211 fails to understand the difference in approach to secondary legislation between uh, what happens in, the, in Westminster and what is being proposed here in terms of the super affirmative process. And it is important to put this on the record. We are proposing a very clear super affirmative uh, uh, procedure. We have uh, in this bill, with the committee's agreement, established an independent commission. It has a clear role in terms of uh, compliance, uh, checking anything that a future government might bring, this government or a future government might bring, in terms of compliance with human rights. Uh, but, if, but it seems to me that fundamentally Amendment 211 diminishes the role of this parliament, and I think that is quite wrong. Its main effect is to open ministers to judicial review if it is considered that regulations contain retrogressive provision without specifying what is meant by retrogressive provision, therefore leaving it for the courts to determine that. That, for me, is a political judgment that should remain with this parliament. And I would, <coughs> excuse me, in conclusion, urge members to vote against this amendment and also Amendment 131B. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I ask Mr Griffin to wind up on Amendment 131B and to press or withdraw this amendment? Um, I'll just wind up by saying that um, while I appreciate the committee members might want to dispose of certain amendments to stop them coming back at stage three, that and has no bearing on whether we may or may not bring them back in a, an amended form at stage three, um, but in saying that, we would seek not to press amendment um, in Paul McNeill's name. Thank you, Mr Griffin. So the question to the committee is, do they accept that that amendment is withdrawn? No. As I said, I'd like to push that we... So you want to vote. move amendment 131B? Yeah. Um, so the question is that amendment 131B be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. Um, can we... Are those in favour of 131B, please vote. Those against? Any abstentions? The result of the division are two votes for, six against. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Um, so I call amendment 131A in the name of... Uh, not moved, thank you. Uh, so I move to the Minister and ask the Minister to press or withdraw amendment 131. Press. Thank you. The question is that amendment 131 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I call Amendment 132 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 131 and ask the Minister to move formally. Move formally. So the question is that Amendment 132 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. no. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, it's a division. Um, those in favour of Amendment 132, please show their hands. Those against? Those abstaining? Thank you. Mark, Mark didn't vote. Do you, want, do you want to abstain? Do you want to no, just, yeah, just too late. <laughs> <laughs> so the result of the division are six <laughs> votes for and one abstention. The, the uh, Amendment 132 is therefore agreed. Um, a call on Amendment 211 in the name of Mark Griffin already debated with Amendment 131 and asked Mr Griffin to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. I want you to go. No, no, you go. No, 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 no <laughs> idea. <laughs> uh, I'm quite happy to move again, on the, for the reasons that I mentioned earlier on. So, can they move? Yeah. So, Mr. Balfour's moving Amendment 211. So, um, the question is that Amendment 211 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No, no. Uh, can those in favour of 211 please show their hands? Those again? And, 
we, can we do can that? Can we do that again? Yes. Okay. So the question is that Amendment 211 be agreed. No, sorry. The qu question is those in favour of Amendment 211, please show their hands. Those against. And those abstaining. Uh, the result of the division were um, no votes for, eight votes against. The amendment is therefore not agreed. So the question is that section 56 and 57 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. And the question is that the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. And that ends stage two consideration of the bill. And I thank the minister, officials and the members for taking part and thank the parliament staff once again for their efforts to make sure that today could go ahead. We won't be meeting next week and we'll be in touch with um, future dates for committee. Thank you.